you very much for this very, very kind introduction. And I'm sorry, I have to apologize. My Russian is now too poor to make uh, a talk in, in, uh, in Russian, so I'll speak English. Um, uh, so first, le let me introduce myself and tell you a little bit about what I did. Um, I was, I've been working for Le Monde for probably 25 years, I guess. And before that, I was, uh, uh, I worked with Agence France Presse, uh, which is a different kind of uh, journalism, but uh, quite interesting, where, where trust is of the essence. We will come back to this uh, later in, in, in this talk. And um, I mostly worked as a foreign correspondent uh, through my career before I became uh, uh, an editor, and I was an editor for two years, the editor of Le Monde for two years, 2010-2011. Um, uh, um, and, uh, you know, when uh, Yena asked me to come back and talk to you uh, for this media seminar, I wondered what would be um, most interesting to talk about, and very Easily, I, I thought about the issue of trust. Um, why trust? Although it sounds very abstract, but in journalism, in fact, it's very concrete. Uh, trust is essential to, to journalism. Uh, without trust, um, you may produce entertainment, which is you know, one of the functions of the media now, but it's, for me, it's not the basic function. Uh, the basic function is information. And without trust, information is worthless. Um, and you cannot uh, fulfill, uh, journalism cannot fulfill its uh, democratic function if it's not trusted, if the element of trust is missing. Uh, there are two levels of trust. So there, there's trust between the journalist and the sources and his sources. Um, and there's, that's the upper level if you want. And there's trust between the media and readers. I will use the word readers, you know, it can be listeners, it can be uh, um, consumers, whatever, but basically it's the people who are uh, following you as a media. Um, trust is a relation which needs to be built upon. It needs to be constantly maintained. You cannot take it for granted. You can be trusted one day and completely distrusted, distrusted the next day. Uh, it's a very fragile commodity. So um, it's something you have to work on constantly. Regarding the first level, the trust uh, between media and their sources, you know, there's not, um, there's no guidebook for this. Uh, I'm not even sure it is uh, taught in schools of journalism. It's um, your instinct and your moral principles guide you through this. Um, I think to be trusted by your sources, you have to be honest, basically. Um, there are plenty of uh, uh, nuances of relationship with your sources. Uh, sometimes you have to negotiate about an information, and this is not, this is possible. Negotiating is possible, uh, but within certain boundaries. And you have to navigate yourself uh, within those boundaries and see what is feasible and what is not feasible. Of course, you know, depending on the political environment, it will be different. Um, some informations you come to learn are too explosive. Uh, um, some of them you really need to trust yourself, your source. Uh, you may not be complete 100% sure and you have to uh, assess uh, um, how far you can go in uh, publishing, in making this information public if you're not 100% uh, 
um, sure of it, you need, of course, there's the basic principle of double checking your information, to, to check it with various sources. Um, but I would say, you know, usually your own judgment is, uh, is uh, the, the, the thing you have mostly to rely on. Um, you have to beware, I think, of close friendship with your sources. Uh, this is a, a matter with, uh, which is very controversial in, in our circles, in Paris at least. Uh, we get a lot of criticism for being too close to our sources, particularly in political circles or in business circles. You know, uh, journalists who become very specialist, specialized uh, tend to get too close to their sources. And I think this is definitely uh, a danger. And when your sources become your close friends, you lose your distance and you lose your critical um, uh, view of, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very dangerous. It's a slippery slope. And I think the best thing is not, <laughs> not to befriend your your sources too much. You also have to be very careful about conflicts of interest. Um, because once those sources know that you may be, you have this weak point of being too close to them or having interests which uh, uh, may contradict, uh, come in contradiction with uh, what you write about, they will um, lose respect for you and they will try to manipulate you one way or the other and they and it will become known among those sources who talk to each other so um, you know if you get um, uh, really too close I would say change uh, the subject of your investigations or and pass it on to one of your colleagues um, Regarding the second level of uh, trust, which is probably the most important one, it's the trust between uh, the media and, and their readers. In, in the West, we've seen a, a very a constant erosion of this trust. That's why I was saying it, it's a very fragile commodity. Um, I've made some research for this and I've seen two studies. One is um, a Gallup poll in about um, Americans and their media, uh, which shows that uh, only four Americans out of 10 have uh, a great deal or a fair amount of trust uh, in, uh, and confidence in the media to, to report news fully and accurately and fairly. Um, this is a recent situation. This has been the case for the past decade, more or less. Uh, before 2004, the level of trust was much higher. Um, there was a majority of people who trusted their media in, in, in the US. Uh, the highest point was in 1998 and 1999, when 55% of American people did uh, trust their media. Uh, there is another um, another study, which John is probably very familiar with, because it comes from the Reuters Institute um, for the study of journalism, which has a, um, a yearly report, um, and it's about not only the U.S. but also Western Europe, and it shows the same trend. Um, so you have, uh, sorry, I have to take my glasses. <laughs> Can't find them, but okay. <laughs> Here it is. You see, you know, I'm getting old. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, In Finland, for instance, which is the, the bright case, Finland is the place where people, where a majority of people trust their media. Uh, in the US, this is lower than the uh, figures I found with the Gallup poll. It's one third of people. 
uh, it's the same in Spain, it's the same in Italy. Only one third of people trust the media. In France, it's just above a third, it's 38%. Uh, Australia, 39%. Japan, a bit better, 46%. So uh, only Scandinavian countries seem to have a, a better level of trust in their media. Uh, what we found also is that the younger you are, uh, the less you will trust the media. Uh, this trust is higher among, uh, among young people. Trust in the news media rises with age, education and income. Um, and so, Yes, and the reasons for this uh, distrust is accuracy um, and also concerns around agendas and bias, political or commercial. So what, um, how can we explain this, this uh, decline in trust? Um, there is, it is part of a ger general decline in trust in institutions, in public institutions, particularly political, uh, government, you know, Congress, elected uh, officials, and so the media are part of this, uh, of this trend. Um, but there also, I think there are also a big part of, his, of this uh, distrust which is self-inflicted. There have been very uh, publicized cases of, um, of the media making huge mistakes. Uh, you've probably heard during the Iraqi war uh, or the Iraqi invasion in 2003 and I, uh, and I mentioned that this decline uh, was, notice it was strong since 2004, so uh, Iraq in invasion of Iraq was in, happened in 2003, and you may remember that the New York Times had this really big fallout with its readers about uh, the weapons of mass destruction and how it accepted the official, the government version of uh, weapons of mass destruction being present in Iraq, and that was the main justification for, for the invasion. And um, it took, I think generally um, the American media after September 11 and during the Iraqi campaign, the Iraqi war, went the wrong way. They trusted their government too much. They took everything for granted. They lost their critical, you know, their function of uh, um, criticism and skepticism, for m more than criticism, the, the natural skepticism that the media should have, this behavior that we must have naturally, was gone in the years after September 11. And uh, a lot of several media, American media made um, a couple of years later, went back to this period and looked at it critically and, and uh, in the New York Times, for instance, apologized to its readers once they really understood what had been going, going on and the mistakes they made. But this, so uh, my hat, you know, uh, uh, off for, to the New York Times for acknowledging its mistakes and, and making amends, but this was a big factor in the decline of trust uh, in, in the media in America. There have been other cases, um, but this is to, sh to tell you how fragile it is. Readers are not stupid. Um, they usually see when there is something wrong, and <coughs> even if they follow you, which was the case after September 11 in America, uh, then when they realize they have been misled, they uh, keep this memory for a long time, and we are still paying for it. Um, at the moment in France, you know, we are <coughs> we've had um, uh, also terrorist attacks last year, and I w I've been very careful to watch this, to watch our reaction, and I think we have, in a way, understood the lessons from uh, our American colleagues and we are trying 
uh, not to fall in the same trap. And this is for this is the case for journalists. This is also the case for politicians because the political it's another issue. But uh, I have to mention it as well. Um, in the months and maybe years, a couple of years after September 11 in America, the level of political debate had really gone down. There was a, a very strong unanimity, political unanimity. And, um, you know, people couldn't really contradict the government. In France at the moment, it's, com it's very different. We are having a very, very lively debate about uh, how far the security measures are, are going. You know, we have a state of emergency since November, uh, which gives more powers to the police. And uh, a lot of people see it as, uh, as dangerous for, for private, for individual liberties. Actually, our justice minister resigned yesterday because she disagreed with um, uh, some um, anti-terror proposals which have been made by the government. So. Uh, and the press is extremely careful. Um, I think even my paper is even a little bit, is going a little bit too far in this respect because we are obsessed with these individual liberties. And my colleagues, some of my colleagues who uh, um, as a principle cherish those liberties completely forget that we have a terrorist situation and um, you know, we had attacks which killed 130 people in November, which followed uh, 10 months earlier other attacks, and we realized that not very much had been done in those 10 months between those two attacks. And, um, you know, people have to be protected. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's true that the police in some, sometimes mm -hmm. need to uh, be able legal to need, uh, needs the legal powers to raid uh, houses at night uh, if they n have suspicions so that uh, you know uh, illegal activity is going there is going on there um, and that's why we have this state of emergency but I think it is very healthy that we are very closely watching this situation we have a blog called uh, we have started a blog at Le Monde called um, watching the state of emergency and which is really a watchdog and even though it's probably very irritating for the government and even for some of us <laughs> which uh, find that it's uh, going a little bit too far but I think it's I'm very glad that we are having it's it was actually started by the journalists themselves not by the editors it's uh, the journalists who are who cover this uh, Beat who said, let's start this blog and everybody who has complaints can uh, can uh, feed it. And so we've organized it a little bit better. Uh, but it's 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 a very good thing that we have this uh, this watchdog. So and this is totally in this um, respect. Uh, it's a trust building measure, I would say, for our readers, uh, because many of them are also suspicious of um, of the government attitude. Um, uh, now, how do you build trust when you are in a situation where readers uh, are inclined to not to trust you? Because there's also, um, I, I'm going to mention a movie which is just coming out in, in Paris. I don't know if it's been out here. It's called Spotlight. Uh, it's a movie about the Boston Globe investigation. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, about uh, the uh, rapes and pedophilia cases uh, that the church, the Catholic Church, uh, was involved in in Boston uh, in two, you know, in in the year. Uh, I think the investigation was uh, done in two thousand one. Uh, so the, the all this crime happened before, and um, I will tell you a little bit more about this movie, but it reminds me of All the President's Men, which is another movie which, you know, was really uh, to the glory of journalism about the Watergate um, um, investigation in, uh, with President Nixon in, 
in the 70s. Uh, but in the 70s, they didn't have it. We didn't have internet. And now this, you know, this is also something which is a big, big factor in the level of trust between uh, readers and the media. Readers have access to internet, and so they can check uh, <laughs> what uh, mainstream media journalists uh, report, or, or they think they can check, sometimes they do, uh, they are able to check, and sometimes it's just, um, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories going on, you can find anything on the internet, I'm sure you're all extremely familiar with this. Um, but this is also a new factor that journalists in, the, in mainstream media and professional journalists have to take into account that, um, uh, you know, if they want to be trusted, they also have to see what's going on on the internet, what is being talked about, what is uh, going on social media, and um, sometimes, um, try to contradict them if they think it's false. Now, in this, um, in this case, uh, this Boston Globe uh, investigation, what is very, I think this is the best bil trust building operation you can imagine for a newspaper, um, because these uh, pedophilia cases and rapes by priests had been going on for, uh, for quite some time, but they were unreported uh, and there was a big, I mean, it was known in the community that this was happening, but it was um, not, it was, there was a big cover up by the church hierarchy. Um, and so the truth eventually came out, not from the police investigation, not from the judiciary, uh, not from the church itself, of course, but from journalists. And this, this movie, which I hope you will be able to see, shows really the painstaking work that the journalist, this team of investiga investigative journalists uh, did, you know, but it's really a long, uh, difficult, not particularly glamorous job of going door to door to question people to, you know, one person leads to another or, and, and so you follow this trail and then you spend hours and hours in archives, in libraries, going through material, legal material. You know, it's, um, it's a very difficult work. Um, you also have to break up, I was talking earlier about the cozy friendship, uh, friendly relations that we sometimes have with our sources. In that case, they had to break, their break up their relationship with lawyers um, or Catholic influential figures in Boston. Uh, but this eventually um, brought a, a huge journalistic operation. It's, um, uh, I think they published around 250 articles about this issue, and that brought a lot of people to call them, you know, uh, um, I think uh, about 300 victims came up, showed up after reading those articles. I mean, it, it's really a very big story, and uh, an, ex an, an, an exemplary uh, story, which I think has done really a lot for the readers of the Boston Globe and has restored, I'm sure, has been a big factor in restoring trust um, between the readers and their media. Um, I, would, I will give you another example of um, trust, which is something which is actually going on at the moment, and I'm still trying to analyze it. Um, in Le Monde, after these attacks on November 13, we decided to do uh, profiles of um, all the victims. So I told you there were 130 victims, and we thought, um, we will publish a profile of every one of them um, because we didn't want them to be just a figure, um, you know, casualties, anonymous casualties. We thought they had a, uh, it was a way of bringing them back to life, if I may say, or just to, to um, 
uh, we were also interested in knowing who they were, uh, why they had been killed. You know, I guess we were trying to make some sense of this uh, of these attacks, and so we asked the journalists if they wanted to volunteer, and many of them did. So in the end, we had 79 journalists involved in, in those profiles. And the rule was that the profiles would have to be done um, not with things you pick up on Facebook or you know or you hear in local newspapers or whatever, but seriously, um, reliably going, contacting the relatives of the victims. Um, talking to several of them, not only one, you know, having the relatives, the friends, and, you know, <coughs> not very long pieces because we didn't, we, we didn't have much but enough space, but um, comprehensive um, profiles. So, and we published five a day. We built, we, so we had this both on the web, uh, on the website with a very nice um, design, uh, I mean, it was very nicely done, I must say, on the, on the web, um, much better than in the print uh, newspaper, as often happens now. Um, and uh, we, ask, we also asked the, the families to give us one picture, one or two pictures, their favorite picture of the, of the victim. Anyway, so we started to publish this like one week after the attacks, uh, five profiles a day. And it, quickly became known as the memorial of the victim of the November 13 victims and what I'm getting at which I found really interesting was the reaction of the readers which was really not something we expected we just did this because we thought it was uh, uh, journalistic journalistically interesting to do but the readers immediately reacted massively and very, very positively, and commanding us, and thanking us, and and saying this is uh, fantastic what you're doing. Uh, <coughs> this is uh, a revenge on on the terrorists. Uh, this is um, um, a mission of journalism that you should follow uh, more often. And so, you know, the the amount of reactions, of positive reactions we got, made us realize that in fact our readers are hungry for more positive news and more uh, or less negative journalism which is what we do most of the time because well as you know uh, we we are all we are more interested in the trains which uh, uh, arrive late that in the trains which arrive on time this is not news a train which arrives on time so we uh, I must say in, in European media, particularly I think American media are a little bit different, but European media are, uh, at least in France, are fairly negative. And we realize after exchanges with our readers on this issue of the memorial of the victims that um, readers, uh, that this is a factor of distrust, the fact that we are so negative, that when we, um, in our investigative journalism, we go after people. That's what the British call the gotcha mentality, that you want to get people. Um, there is, you know, it's, um, it's a kind of, I'm, I wouldn't say it's, it's uh, vengeance or revenge, or because we don't have, uh, uh, this kind of feelings, but it's true that many of us, we quite enjoy <laughs> getting at powerful people, but sometimes they are not even powerful. Sometimes very simple people get caught in this, and uh, sometimes wrongly. Um, and I think this is something we have to be very, very careful at. We can destroy lives very easily, uh, even, you know, if then we sometimes acknowledge our mistakes and say, oh, we're sorry, um, this was a mistake, we didn't mean this, we have, you know, uh, this uh, sometimes the, the justice uh, process gets into it. And But p when people are exposed in the media and wrongly exposed, um, their lives usually are fairly destroyed. So. Um, 
I think, you know, talking about trust, this is something uh, we also have to be reflective on. Um, what else? There were a couple of other examples um, I wanted to uh, tell you about. Yes, um, in Germany, after what happened in Cologne on New Year's Eve, the media came under a lot of criticism, and this is also an issue we have to, to face. Uh, we have tensions in our societies um, because of uh, a, a high level of immigration. We now have to, uh, uh, we have even before the, the terrorist attacks, we have this coexistence of uh, various, um, how would I say, religions or ways of life. And we, ten we have to be careful about this. We know as media that we have to be responsible, that we don't want to inflame the debate, that we, so this is something which is difficult, is how far do you go in, um, uh, avoiding to inflame relations. Uh, so we thought we had a balance uh, and that our readers were quite happy with this balance because they also live in this uh, new complex environment and they don't necessarily want to have uh, um, to, to stir things up. But we see that in, in uh, Germany, the media came under really a lot of criticism because they were accused of covering up those attacks in Cologne. Um, some of them did apologize, like the TV uh, ZDF uh, said, you know, they issued a formal apology. Um, and some of them just didn't do it international, international intentionally. Um, they didn't realize what was going on. I think it's a kind of self uh, unconscious self-censorship. Um, but my, one of my German colleagues told me that they were in his newspaper, they were getting so much email infuriated by their readers saying, you have been hiding this to us, you have intentionally covered it up and, and that they have to be now, um, there was a breach of trust with their readers and they have to be very careful and that was really difficult now for them to recover and, and reorg reorganize their coverage. Um, so this is, this is more or less a, a general um, uh, description of the issues we face in, in European media and American media about trust. I know that in, this is a free press environment and I'm sh I guess that in a not unfree environment, it's, uh, you have many more issues of, uh, of um, uh, trust. Um, and I, I would actually be happy to hear your questions and your comments about this seen from your own experience and, and, and your own interrogations. But I think, you know, I was, when I was preparing this, I was thinking about how is it for you? Um, but I think the principles are the same. The environment is more difficult, definitely. Uh, but the principles which guide you are the same. It's that you need trust. You need to be trusted by your readers and your readers know, um, I suppose, um, or they suspect, um, where is the truth, how far you can go in looking for the truth, in expressing it or in publishing it. Um, so I would say the lessons that we have been learning are probably also lessons for you. Now I'll be happy to hear your comments about this. Yeah. Thank you very much. I suppose a remarkable example of ethics, professional and journalist and human